Hey, gang, this episode of WTF is sponsored by Stamps.com. Go to Stamps.com and type in WTF when you click the radio microphone to start a no-risk trial and get a $110 bonus offer. That's Stamps.com. Enter WTF. Do it up. Okay, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers, what the fuck buddies, what the fuck nicks, what the fuckstables, what the fuckleberry fins? That's it. I am Mark Marin. This is WTF. This is my show. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, hope you're having a good drive, walk, run, treadmill time, whatever it is. Hope you're you're getting that painting done. Whatever, whenever you listen to me, I, I hope everything is okay. You know, things are not great. And I won't bum anybody out, man, but it, it's weird. It's weird being who I am and, and knowing that uh, you know, I'm going through things and I'm trying to figure out how to tell you guys. You know, I'm trying to figure out, you know, I'm living my life, and because of the relationship I have with you, I got to figure out, well, how do I frame what I'm going through? How do I talk about it with them? And, uh, you know, let them know what's up because that is what I do. It's, it's crazy. It's fucking crazy. Well, look, today on the show, Natasha Leone is on the show. And I just want to say that this was taped. I believe she had uh, already taped Orange is the New Black or, or some of it. And it had not been released yet, but she was excited about it. And since then, it's sort of taken off. And I'm thrilled that, uh, you know, this happened for her and that the show and everybody loves the show. Uh, this is an intense story, uh, you know, and uh, we had a great conversation. She's so fucking bright and funny and and her life took her to a pretty a pretty dark place. And um, and we get to it. And why don't I do this? Is that a way to set up a plug? I usually I just kind of move into it smoothly but uh, but listen let's be honest there are over eight million small businesses out there many of them are still wasting time going to the post office for their mailing and shipping you've heard me say it before but there's a much better way uh stamps.com people stamps.com brings all the services of the post office right to your fingertips use your own computer and printer and get official u.s postage for any letter or package stamps.com will send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage for any class of mail. I wouldn't use it if it wasn't easy and convenient because that's the way I am. And now I've been using it for three years, people. Right now, use my promo code WTF for this special offer. Start a no-risk trial with a $110 bonus offer that includes a digital scale and up to $55 in free postage. Don't wait. Go to Stamps.com, and before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in WTF. That's stamps.com. Enter WTF. Okay, so do that. And also, I wanted to say I'm going to be in San Francisco uh, Wednesday. That's this Wednesday. What's that? The 16th for one night. I'm going to be in conversation with Adam Savage. He's going to be interviewing me uh, until I start interviewing him, I imagine. That's uh, the City Arts and Lecture uh, series. It's going to be at the Norse Theater. You can go to WTFPod.com to uh, get tickets for that. I'm excited about it. I, I, I like talking, and he's a bright guy, and he's a you know, great guy. All right, now look, you know, um, it's, you know, it's a rough time right now, and, and it, because, uh, you know, as some of you know, and, and as I've alluded to, you know, on this podcast, uh, you, you know I'm not an easy fella, and, you know, I'm an, you know, I, I'm in a relationship that was difficult. And it was difficult for a long time for a lot of reasons. And, uh, and it just, um, it became for me, uh, too much. And I, I ended, uh, my relationship, uh, with Jess. And it's horrible. It's just a horrible feeling. Because, well, let's see if I can just parse this out. Yeah, Cause it, you know, it's, it, it's hard to, to, to break up with somebody that you love and care about, but you know you have to do it. I don't think I've ever done it before. I don't think I've ever done something, you know, this difficult in relationship before. I care about her immensely. 
and I love her, but we could not go on the way we were going on, at least from where I was sitting, at least from my side of it. Look, I know I'm a pain in the ass. I know I'm difficult. I also know that the relationship had gotten rather toxic, and it, it takes two to toxic. And we did, well, I did, we did, you know, we were trying to make it work and it wasn't working and I'm fucking heartbroken about it. It was not over anything simple. I'm not going to talk about, you know, what happened. I, I just wanted to let you guys know that's what's been going on. And, uh, and it's just, it's, it's just heartbreaking. I'm sad. It's been a long time since I've, I've been alone. And, uh, and she's a great person, but it was, it, it, it just, it just got too difficult and, and I, and I had to, uh, I had to end it and it's, it's just awful because, you know, I, um, you know, I've been, I've been, I've you know, I have not, I, I just can't seem to do a, you know, a healthy relationship. And, you know, I want to, and you think sometimes you think like, well, maybe I'm different. You know, maybe things have changed. Maybe I'm a, I'm a new guy. You try to do it differently. And then you, you know, you engage in a certain way over a certain amount of time and the same sort of things happen. You know, the same negative things happen. They come out of me and they engage with her negative things. And, and it's, it, it just, it's just horrible. Because we had plans, you know, we were going to get married and, uh, it just, you know, just, it couldn't, it, I couldn't go further. And I don't, I don't like the fact that, you know, now I've hurt another person. I never, I didn't want to hurt her and, uh, and I have, and she's, you know, angry and, and sad and I tried to handle it as decently as possible, but, but, you know, I did break up with her. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just, it, it feels horrible and I'm sad and I'm heartbroken because it didn't work and it's disappointing and it's painful. And I'm not usually the guy that does this in any sort of, you know, responsible or, or, or structured way. I mean, generally I let things just blow up until somebody hates me so much. They just tell me to, that they can't take it anymore. But I, I have too much respect for her and, and I, you know, and I first, you know, respect for what we were you know, trying to do. The hardest thing about, about being in a situation like this or, or, or having to do something that you fundamentally don't want to do because your heart is involved, but you know it's the right thing to do is that, you, you know, I, I want her to be happy. I want her to have the life that, that she wants to have. And, you know, just in where we were headed and what was going on between us, that was not going to happen. It was not going to happen with me. And again, it's not a simple thing. It's not just about a baby. It's not just about a marriage. It's not, it's, it's just, it, it's deeper. And it was, it was just painful and difficult to know that. But God damn it. You know, I want her to be happy. I've never been more connected to someone in my life. So this is very difficult and very sad. And that's it. You know, that's, that's what's going on. And as I said, it's been a long time since I've been alone. And, and I find that, you know, I'm, you know, wandering around my house, you know, not knowing what to do with myself. Uh, she took up a, a large, a large part of my heart and my brain. Um, I get very OCD when I'm sad, a lot of, uh, you know, rearranging things and cleaning things out. So that's, what's been going on. And I don't know, man, I don't know if I'm ever going to get it right, but, uh, I did, I do know that, you know, whatever I have to do, whatever I, I've got to do to, you know, get myself straight with this shit you know i i got it i got to do alone and um i mean that's just the fucking reality oh man but it, it was interesting you know after it all came to to sort of go down in the last couple of weeks have been pretty horrible and she uh she moved out and that day i came back to uh to the house for the first time, you know, 
when she wasn't there and it's just, you just don't know what the hell you're going to feel, you know? And it was, it's just, you know, there's just part of the brain that you, is so connected, you know, for, for better, or for worse with, with somebody else that you love and that you're in a relationship with. And, and now that's, that's not there. So I had an empty house in my head and I had a half empty house in my, uh, in reality. And I walked through it and, and then went out, I went out onto the front porch and I swear to God, this is true. I went out onto the front porch and, uh, I was just standing there looking out and fucking deaf black cat came up onto the step on the front porch. Now I, this cat is a cat that I almost exclusively see out back. He just came up on the front porch and he just looked at me and I hadn't seen him in like four days. I was like, you want to eat? And, uh, you know, I went in, got some food. I usually fit him out back. I feed him out back, but he was up front. And, uh, you know, I put the food out for him. And I put the water out. And he just came back and, you know, looked at me some more and then just, just took off. Didn't eat the food. It was almost like he was like, you see, you all right? I'm just checking up. I know some... Some shit's going down and, you know, just, just want to check up. I'm good. Are you good? All right. Well, I'll eat out back when I'm hungry. I just want to make sure you are all right. That's how I read it. So now, you know, um, you know, we'll, we'll work through this together. I'm not going to be a, uh, you know, like a, a downer about it. I'm not going to justify anything. I'm not going to, uh, you know, characterize what happened. You know, I'll take responsibility for, you know, for what I did in it, <sighs> pow, just shit my pants. Um, just coffee dot co op. You can get it at wtfpod.com. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where we're at. So that's what's going on. And thank you for listening. So let's talk now to Natasha Leone. This is heavy, but it's good. She's, uh, she's great. And I couldn't be happier for her success. <laughs> Natasha Leone, right? Leone. I think it's Leone. Leone. Uh huh. I knew that. Okay. I put an I put an A, yeah, but there is an E on the end. Yeah. But it's uh, what, where's the where's the name come from? It's not your real it's, uh, name. Right? French. <laughs> <laughs> it comes from France. Wait, how'd you how'd you choose that one? Uh, it's my um, it's my middle name. It is. Actually, Bianca is also my middle name. So like, Natasha wait, Bianca Leone. Yeah, but I'm not getting into the rest of it. I just can't handle it. Too yes, early. If you want to go back to talking about Eichmann in Jerusalem, I can handle that a lot easier than I can. What, what's into the it. rest of it? Listen, what? you have the internet. Already? You own the internet. I don't. It's not like there's no secrets left in this society. Yeah, but I want to hear you say it. I want to hear you. I want to hear the. Word. I want to let you know that I've done a lot of work of myself <laughs> to get to a place where I can say I am not mature enough to handle this conversation right now. You know what I mean? You're not. You're, you know, you, I got you, a lot of. Family history it comes with. Uh huh. You can't handle saying your last name. My mother's name. maiden name is Bookinger. I'll give you that much. Yeah, I'm going to get Bookinger. Yeah. I can't get the. If uh, you want, you could even pronounce it Bookinger if that makes you feel better. Yeah. You want to just pronounce it Jew? Well. <laughs> I mean, it really is. That really is the point, right? Did you want to light a cigarette? Okay. <laughs> I like. It. Wait, did you used to smoke in those lozenges? Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't smoked in ten years. I do have to quit. Do you? It's hard, man. It's yeah, a hard how did one. you do it? Well, I'm clearly still on nicotine. I yeah. mean, uh, for I ten years you've been on nicotine. Yeah, one way or the other, I've gone without it for a few months here and there. But uh, you know, I, I I stopped a lot of things. You know, I have to assume nicotine has some negative consequences. And now I find that these lozenges have are there. There's mannitol in them, which is uh, kind of laxative ish. So there's that it's side. Like, it's like cigarettes. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, a little bit. Um, you stopped a lot of stuff, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, you feel yeah. good about it? <laughs> I was like, no, I just started shooting heroin. <laughs> like, actually, no. That's never happened here. If you, you know wanna, what I mean? If you want to relapse on heroin no, on my but show. I do happen to have a, this like, <laughs> rock of crack in a pipe, and I know you've got some history in the same subject, so I uh, <laughs> felt like this was the time and place. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had someone come out on the show. I've never had someone relapse on crack on the show. I think that would be good. Yeah. How long has it been? Uh, it's like seven and a half years. Really? Yeah. That's good. So you were through all the fucking... Uh, yeah, but that was brutal. Let's Horrendous. Like really doing it. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, I think that's why so many people uh, struggle to stick with it. I mean, yeah. it is not for the for the faint, faint of, of heart. heart. <laughs> what getting clean, getting sober? yeah. I mean, if you're really gonna do it, and you know, yeah. I mean, if you're as low bottom of a case as I was, which was like a real yeah sort of like a hope to die junkie, you yeah, know, yeah, then uh, I, just, I wish you good luck. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And Godspeed with the. Uh, I mean, like, I had someone describe it to me as, like, not only do you have to, like, smash down the house, but you have to, like, then um, take out the Indian burial ground underneath the foundation of the house <laughs> yeah. and then, like, begin to rebuild. So, I mean, that process to me is certainly why I think a lot of people, like, 28 days later can't really hack it, you know, because it's not a 28 day scene. No, no, it's not. All. It's not. And, and really, but, and with dope, it's, it seems like there'd be a bigger struggle. You know, like, dudes, you know, because I know guys who were who were junkies and a lot of them a couple of the ones that i know a couple of the junkies i know they ended up drinking but not doing dope anymore you know they ended up doing other stuff but it just seems like the relationship with heroin is so much deeper (laughs) than just you know yeah i mean i think a lot of ways it really speaks to like aesthetics or something i think that we all get so hooked on this uh like in our like that for me and the existential angst of my teenage years it was like really getting hooked on the uh aesthetic appeal of just like so many of of these the heroes. legendary yeah of these heroes oh, that were too, these man. you know massive characters that oh, just yeah. seem like like I'm going to walk in line with you know All my my friends you know yeah. and um and I do think that that's part of what's tricky like you know uh it's hard to listen to music when you get clean because it just you know brings up all that stuff of like the I romantic- want to be the fucking cool guy you right know? yeah romanticizing like, it like big time yeah you oh, know? me too me too well, and it's you, not very like a series of you know platitudes uh, certainly don't feel very romantic by comparison. You know what I mean? If you have the sort of a makeup <laughs> that was, like leads you to want to like you know shoot up while listening <laughs> to Lou Reed in the first place <laughs> you know, to just day, be like one day at a time. One day at a time. You know what I mean? One day at a time feels a little bit like that's possibly the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life as a solution to my fucking problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do. So I don't even know how it uh, really happens. I guess pretty magical. But you're. I, it's weird. Because because you, uh, I mean, you're younger than I am, and uh, but you, I mean, you grew up in where you grew up in me in Manhattan, right? Mm-hmm. So you grew up in it. I mean, that was the birthplace of all of it, of all that dirty, junky rock and roll business. Yeah. So where 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 did Richard you... Hell is my father? So it's true. It was really he is hard not. for me. It, it is. My last name is Hell. Stop and it, Hellenstein. Stop it. So he's a sweet guy. He's sober. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know him, but I'd like yeah. to. He's around. I mean, he write. He write I like a, to know him. I mean, sleep with him. Yeah, <laughs> you can sleep with Richard Hell, yeah. maybe. But he, a lot of those guys, I think, are older. They're married. But he wrote a book. I interviewed him a few years ago yeah. when I was on another thing. And he's uh, he's okay. He's one of the few that lived yeah. out of that whole thing. You read uh, uh, Please Kill Me, right? Well, of course. That's yeah. the Bible, right? Is that what you built your yeah. life on? I mean, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> that and Hammer of the God. <laughs> <laughs> and Cassavetes on Cassavetes. Uh-huh. And was, uh, those are it? Uh, what part uh, of the city you grew up in? Well, I was not really in the birthplace of dirt. I was in, I was on the Upper East Side. Yeah. I was on the Upper East Side. Right. I actually speak like this. Yeah. And, um, and I was like, but I was a scholarship kid on the Upper East Side. Right. With like a single mother. And so I was in a, an outcast. And, what, an outcast? And I was how? in Yeshiva. You know, I was in Yeshiva on the Upper East Side, the Rabbi Joseph H. Lookstein Upper School of Ramaz uh-huh. and Lower School. And, uh, you oh know, I was a bad kid, a bad influence. Um, so I was expelled a, for like selling weed to the children, but simultaneously a, I was in like honors Talmud classes and, you know, reading Aramaic, you know? Really? Yeah. So you grew up with full on Orthodox Jew? Well, I'm, um, you know, my father's side Flatbush and my mother's side Auschwitz. So I'm sort of like <laughs> d- deep in the sweet spot and they're both sort of like the black sheep wild ones of their otherwise sort of very conservative families, but... Even that was still very orthodox. But your mother wasn't a survivor. Your grandparents? No, my grandparents, yeah. So you grew up with that very real reality of hearing those stories. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, there was a lot of... I mean, that's one of the things I'm nervous about today is I don't want to, you know, make any jokes. I think I I hang it... I I know so many sort of... uh, Eastern European sort of, you know, many generation later uh, Jews that I think that we can be sort of... uh, you know, uh, light with our kind of like Hitler jokes. And I think it's a sort of a dangerous territory because obviously it's, you know, pretty uh, heavy, real stuff and uh, like the heaviest. But I will say um, that there was like a lot of, you know, Hitler this and Hitler that in my childhood. You know what I mean? Yeah. There was like a lot of, uh, I think that 
uh, Hitler panic was still. How could it not be? How did they get yeah, out? I tracking. mean, do you, do you know the story? I mean, you know, uh, so it's my mother's parents. Yeah. And um, my grandmother, Ella, yeah. was, uh, there was a big family, but really the only people that made it past the, the gas chambers were these three sisters and a brother. Mm-hmm. And the three sisters, um, to, to hear her tell it, she was like, for us, it was not so bad, Zivar. We have blonde hair and blue eyes. And with the blondes and the blues, we were very slim. And um, the, what it was, every day, we have apple. And um, I'm not sure, like, what wh- what I take from that is uh, a really a horror story of what it must have been like to be sort of an attractive, Aryan-looking woman um, in Auschwitz. Yeah. Was... Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I like Victor Frankl has got to be one of like definitely in terms of like what's helped me mm-hmm. uh, over the years to kind of stay in it. Uh, he was the and not self-destructive uh, or something. Therapy guy. Well, yeah, but he was he was the logotherapy guy yeah. who was you know the Holocaust survivor right. that kind of um, came out with it, like you know, man's search for meaning yeah, and that kind right. of a thing. Yeah. But did you find that your grandparents was she telling you that she had to like service? I mean, I don't know. Like, I got to. I mean, it's a weird thing because I'm t- this was her like notorious. I have heard that story so many times. That she was attractive in an Aryan way, and that's why she and survived. That and- she had like you know. We, they, uh, what it was is they are giving us a, a, I have a nice scarf for my head uh-huh. and it's like I mean I, I, just out of all the horror th- that that this is her story to me to right, kind of pass right, on right. you know because I think it's also such a different uh, culture uh, you know meanwhile I will say that in terms of like the drug addiction or whatever I mean, it's super surreal that you know here they had sort of like helped uh, contribute to my treatment expenses and um, when around? I got there, well, um, my grandfather is still alive. My, my grandmother's passed away. But uh, like the, at the table when I came to, you know, visit them for yeah. like a weekend or something, a day trip, they, you know, put a glass of wine at the table. Like just assuming. In other words, I think that the when you're coming from and sort of, uh, you know, the way survivor's guilt tracks in mm-hmm. a way of like um, and minimizing my own uh, difficulty of like yeah. when you come from that sort of lineage, it's very um tricky to like hold your own problems mm-hmm. at not being like the you know what I mean like the dumbest guy in the universe like well hey I don't know what to tell you I really like cocaine <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, yeah. We and were in Auschwitz. <laughs> exactly yeah. and um and I do think that ultimately I guess what I'm saying is that because they survived the yeah, war right. they don't really uh see it you know they survived the war made themselves a really nice life in like Beverly Hills and Hancock Park and all this yeah I don't know. I've never really heard her get into the horror stories of the war because ultimately I think they made it out alive. And it was like by uh, comparison, such a, you know, that to speak about their parents that they lost or the younger siblings that got lost and just the whole horror of it. I never heard anybody get into it. Um, well, they did what they had to do, I think, on some level. Is that, I To think survive that, is right. really the takeaway of my right. impression or whatever, my right. poor Hungarian impression is uh, to say i think that they did what they had to do to survive and and, yeah, uh, and then, then whatever the truth of that is is their it's their business on i some, guess so of course i mean i think it's it's that way with a lot of people that fought in that war period they or any war that yeah. there are certain things that you know uh, the, uh, as a testament to, to survivors and generally they're able to contextualize it and go on i mean there are some people how the hell do you think how would you be able to even fathom it I mean, yeah. some testament to an amazing sort of disposition and fortitude to be able to go, well, you know, it's horrible, but we did it. We're yeah. out. What did they end up doing? How did they build their life here? Um, watches. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Like, sure. uh, you know, the, do you remember the Spiro Agnew watch that had, he was like a cartoon Spiro Agnew with, with hands? The moving hands? Yeah. That's my family's watch. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to make like a nepotistic claim late in my career, but (laughs) that and on my father's side, I'm related to Al Jaffe, who does the back of Mad Magazine. The best. Al Jaffe was the best. Listen, I'm just telling you, I didn't get into showbiz by coincidence. (laughs) I loved Al Jaffe when I was a kid. Al Jaffe opened every door in this town. Did you know that guy? I don't know. It's hilarious. He did the fold-up one, and he did a lot of the art in Mad Magazine. He was one of my favorites. Uh, um, Meanwhile, my uh, my grandfather, Morris, Morris Buckinger, was a... uh, he was like more of an underground war hero who I guess would do things like ride the train back and forth with a limp. And his first wife was a, uh, 
she was like with him in the underground kind of a thing and moving I, Jews around sort of I uh-huh. guess I mean again it's, you, can't, you, can't get, you can't get it huh not only that but like I went to yeshiva for years where like I never you know I, in theory I should know a lot about the Holocaust do they teach that at yeshiva I mean, I remember well, the in Holocaust Hebrew- is like a six-year course. You it's, know to get it's a lifelong course if you're a Jew. It's like, it's Eichmann certain- in Jerusalem. <laughs> I think it's so ironic that I put that. I know. I don't know why you had it here for me. I'm I didn't like, mean to put it there. I, I was why like, everywhere I go. It's I, like Eichmann in Jerusalem. Volume. I grew up with it. <laughs> no, I, I, I took it out because I was looking for it because I had a, I had a discussion with Jeffrey Tambor. Uh, you know, a while back, uh-huh. and he brought up the banality of evil, and uh, and uh, and I I wonder if I still had that book. It was just because I cleaned the garage. It was not meant to provoke anything. No, I mean it's fine. It just seems so a wait, little they, bit like a sensitive subject. That's sort of I weird no that you would like go right yeah. for the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, I was going to put the other one. I had maybe had another book. I had survival in Auschwitz. <laughs> wait, somewhere. why is mine yeah. Kampf yeah. underneath yeah, yeah, my yeah. seat? Yeah, I have that too somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but I had survival in Auf- Auschwitz, that Primo Levi book, which is a great book. Yeah. Because it's all about it's all about the barter system and the, what Jews sort of did yeah. to, to to survive and and have a life in that place. I did this movie um, that uh, this guy Tim Blake Nelson directed called The Gray Zone. I love that, was, that guy. Yeah, I love him too. And uh, and that was that was a, a movie about the Holocaust. I remember calling like my grandmother while preparing. I have a great picture of me and like a. Lenny Bruce T-shirt, yeah. you know, like yeah. truth is a four-letter word, sure. and I'm like, you know, but with like a weird, you know, Mia Farrow crew cut, uh-huh. and uh, and I'm like, and whittled down to ninety pounds, yeah. you know, and I'm like, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> um, behind me, and um, living the dream. Yeah, yeah. And my my grandmother was like, Natalie, why, why are you going back there? The war is over. You don't, because I was asking her all these sort of, you know, historical Which camp research did you go questions. To? You went to a camp. Uh, we shot it in Bulgaria, so it was uh, recreated. Uh huh. And she, and she asked, "Why are you going back there?" Why you- yeah, she was just sort of like, uh, you know, again with this. Like, I have a, yeah, a a cousin who was a teacher, and she's she's ultra orthodox and Flemish. Yeah. Um, and she was like, uh, when I showed that, I'm gonna stop with the emotions. I'm sort of now thinking. It's okay. Of, um, I like it, but it's just hard because right. I just think of them. I can't even think of them without their weird Flemish and Hungarian <laughs> accents. It's just so surreal whenever I walk into that fucking house. So I'm like, who are these people that I'm like hardly? Uh... She like told me about how she felt the need to send. Like, well, she didn't use the word censorship, but right. when she showed Schindler's List to her class of students, you know, she cut out some of the really harsh parts, which is just the sort shower of, scene. Ah, listen, who I knows, know. right? Why'd you cut them out? I don't know. We're like a modern part of society that they're sort of not. I mean, if it's so, if it's still so close to home, like why would you show? Why would you, you know, bring back to light the horrors of the single most horrific? So you period? never forget. <laughs> never forget. We're talking about the Holocaust. I mean, I, I mean, who at Hebrew school they used to show those movies with the the plowing of the bodies. Did anyone the, the... ever show you that movie, The Wave? Mm-mm. Is this a movie? Only Which one's that? I don't know. I just remember what it was a documentary. We watched it. You saw. <laughs> Where you know, did you go to school? I grew up in New Mexico. My parents were from Jersey, but Jews. But we, even in New Mexico, conservative Hebrew uh-huh. school, we saw the movie where the you know they're they're literally plowing bodies into a pit, and pictures of lampshades. It was just like this kind of like, oh, this is it. Yeah, how the hell are you going to wrap your brain around that? Yeah. That it's a human experience. It's sort of amazing that you grew up with it because I don't know many people that grew up. You know, with survivors and their family at this generation. Yeah, I mean, what's really, it's really well. They see that piece in the news about the, the guy who named his kid Adolf Hitler. Yeah, and his other kid is like Heinrich Hans. Yeah, Hans, yeah. Or yeah. He shows up in an SS uniform. Yeah. Like, that's not really going to boo yeah. your case, pal. Yeah. Um, like, hey, what happened to that guy? Did they nail him for hate crime or something? I, I don't know. On some level, I guess if you want to name your kid Hitler, what are you going to do? I'm, I mean, I, I guess what's wild about it is to have to sort of coexist with. Uh, uh, I granted it probably a small part of society, but that thinks, you know, hey, the Holocaust just didn't happen. You know what I mean? It's because just when it's so much a part of your history and like seeing you know, these photos, like I've gone through family photos and you just see it, it, there's like a, a gap between yeah. the time when they kind of built a life again and then these black and white sort of. When they were uh, kids, before yeah. the thing. And there's sort of nothing. Yeah. In between. Well, it, it, I think there is a fear, though. And there, there are Holocaust deniers, but there's also just people. I, I don't, and I think you're right in what you said at the beginning that we sort of take for granted that oh, we can say Hitler, we can say this, Nazis are funny, but the reality of it is beyond anything that yeah. anyone can really fathom. And you know, you had these people that fathomed it, and yeah. even they sort of want to put it in a box a bit. 
just so they can go on with their life. Yeah, because how, how otherwise? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You gonna do? You gonna do? Gonna... So wait, so now your father was uh, uh, Orthodox as well? Yeah, um, he was like, uh, you know, they did a lot, a, a lot of. I think it was like a garment district business. Oh yeah, involved, and then he was, uh, but he was uh, sort of a rebel of his own uh, orthodoxy. I can't yeah. be sure that's a like, word. Like how? Um, was he it? was uh, into like race car driving and uh, boxing promoting. In a yarmulke? So you wore a yarmulke in the race car underneath the helmet? Uh, you know. That's nice. I, uh, I never pictured that before. I, I don't know. I, I never I never saw him in a race car, but I would assume. You heard things? I, I, yeah, but I heard, what I, I heard things. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, didn't, you don't have a relationship with him or you didn't? No, I mean, not now. I, I, I you know, for two years we lived in Israel. Yeah. And How old were you? Eight to ten. Oh, my God. And at the time, I mean, at the time I wanted to be like Golda Meir when I grew up. You know? Sure. And, that's, uh, that's better than Lou Reed, kind of. Uh, it's a little more demanding. Maybe not. <sighs> It's a, it's a hard path either way. Either Gold way. in my ear, Lou Reed, it's a hard path. Yeah. The bottom line is you've got to choose. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. What's um, it going to be? There was a fork in the road, and I chose Lou, and look at me now. It's a nightmare. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, he. Uh, so his big dream at the time was to be like the Don King of Israel and bring <laughs> Mike Tyson to Israel. <laughs> and so there's, like, you know, photos of, like, me in the boxing ring uh-huh. and... You know, like walking around like an American flag yeah, yeah, and yeah. being the uh-huh. uh, whatever that is the the person who holds up the round card. Yeah, the round right, card. Right. Yeah, yeah. Not in a bikini because mm-hmm. I was eight, mm-hmm. though I had a well, terrific. Good that idea. he was appropriate. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure you did. <laughs> but I, but so okay, so you lived in Israel. Was it a kibbutz situation, or you just no. in Jerusalem, or what? I'm pretty Tel-Aviv. sure. In uh, in retrospect, I mean, I think at the time it was explained to me as salvaging the marriage, but. In my adult life, went. I've realized that it was actually probably tax evasion. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> you know. It wasn't, it wasn't I, I think, a spiritual journey. I mean, I think they really made it seem like it was a Zionistic uh-huh. trip. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> but, in fact, I think they just needed to get out of Dodge. Yeah. To a so, place where the law couldn't find them. So how, when did they break up? When I was 10. Okay. And so that's when, you know, I moved back to the city with my mother. And we were suddenly in, like, you know, up to that point, it had been really... I think probably I just wasn't aware of how sort of insane my family life was because yeah. it was still a unit. Yeah. You know, so you just sort of uh, assume that, yeah. like, you know, these guys are the greatest. You know, yeah, like sure. my mother would have, like, red hair and she would yeah. be in a red Alfa Romeo spider yeah. listening to Knights in White Satin nice. again and again. And, like, yeah. my father with a long black ponytail <laughs> and, like, you know, a black Porsche. And, like, in Israel in the 80s, like, had, like heavy intifada time. I mean, these cars were hot commodities. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. I think I just assumed that everything was like copacetic, and <laughs> then all of a sudden I was like a scholarship, a scholarship kid on the Upper East Side, living in like a one room with my mother, you know, in the, a crate of wine, you know, <laughs> like, and I'm sort of like, wait a minute, shit's changed. <laughs> Jokes on me. <laughs> yeah. And well, you're uh, kid. You're supposed to have those feelings. I guess it's always going to be a little disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So you go do the scholarship business. Yeah. You must have been sharp. You seem pretty sharp to me. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Otherwise. So what did you like? What did you learn from studying? Not as sharp as I used to be with yeah, the brain damage. I mean, I mean when you think about on. the whippets. When I think about the whippets, yeah, more than anything, like, you're sharp. You got what the... a scene to just be like, you know what, I need less brain cells. Just yeah, like I, now. Yeah, but I did those too, but I mean, you've got plenty. You yeah. got plenty. They, they, you know, the ones that die, the other ones take over. You got yeah. a lot of unused brain cells up there. You kind of tell myself that about my lungs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you also, you, had a, you lost one, didn't you? What, lung? Yeah. No, I had a, a lung collapse. Oh, okay. And I had some abscesses in there, but, like, yeah. they're fine. Yeah, well, I mean, you cleaned them out, got them let clean. Let me tell you something. Yeah. Can I hike <laughs> up a mountain easy as easy as you yeah, have whatever? <laughs> no. Some other 34-year-old actress? <laughs> no? Maybe not? You know what I mean? You won't see me on Runyon Canyon? Because no, it'll be uh, unappealing. <laughs> you know... It's terrifying. That's <laughs> what I'm trying to say. I'm terrified. Yeah, you know, we're all gonna die, but like, uh, uh, why? Yeah, yeah. Why with the organs? I mean, the internal organs are such I can't a fucking talk about nightmare. It. I, can't I mean, talk it's about a nightmare. It. I can't talk about kidneys. Like, if I'm like, when I hear like, if I go to an AA meeting or something, uh-huh. and someone starts talk, talk, talking about their liver going and shit, I'm like, oh, I can't. I yeah. can't. I just can't. Because you don't want to picture it. Uh-huh. That there, there's this series of fucking things in there that are just pumping along, and one of them crap out on you. And he dies. Yeah, and you're fucked. Listen, I took a fucking x-ray the other day. The lady was like, really? You're only 34? Oh, my God. I was like, thanks. <laughs> what was that based on? <laughs> I was like, I guess just like, you know, 
Whatever, like little, staple scars, oh, like really? whatever. Just you, you know, lived a life. basic uh, road damage. Where's the book? Uh, no, yeah, maybe in the end. <laughs> in the end, but now, <laughs> not yet. I mean, I don't, I don't want to forget things, but yeah. I, must, I, I would like to. Uh, you know, I I have a fantasy of myself, especially a teenage one, where I'm a writer. But I think the reality is, like, you know, I'm just not. So I really have to let it go pull for it now. together. Yeah. But you know, Alan Alda wrote one uh, late in life. That's just you wonderful. can you can always write a book. You know. Well, tell me about the Talmud, please. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll get to your show business career in a minute. But listen, you, I don't. I, it's, you it's, excelled at Talmud. Yeah. What does that look? Like? Isn't yeshiva for Talk a woman? Woody Allen. Uh, what about Talmud? Yeah. Do you know exactly, what I mean? Exactly. Um. Th- did I what? As a, as a woman in yeshiva, I mean, I, you never get the sense. Wait a minute, that, now I have a question. I'm so sorry, mm-hmm. but wait, do you have any internal organ damage? No, no, not that I know of. That's I'm tremendous. a little nervous about my pancreas right now, but I have no right. reason for it. All right, we have to talk about it. as no. a woman in yeshiva. I just was curious. Yeah. But I, you never. I, it always seems like a very male dominated society. I never yeah. think about women going to yeshiva. Yeah, yeah. Is it, it, but they they do obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's I guess it's a slightly more secular approach, or maybe it's just something that happens on the upper east side. I don't know, but. Um, I guess, and just certainly, you know, a lot of uh, Orthodox Jews would be in shock, you know, at the idea because, uh, like, I had one Orthodox Jew recently say that makes no sense. I mean, how are the men with the hormones supposed to focus at that uh-huh, age? Right, yeah. And to uh, to wit, I said, uh, listen, you know, I think when you're surrounded by women you know, all the time, it's probably less intense for you. you right. Can, you know what I mean? When they're in all your classes and you're... Yeah, as opposed to starving yourself. Yeah, and then certain. you're like, uh, we, what are you, you're in prison, Eddie Bunker. I'm yeah, sure yeah. Eddie Bunker in a mixed Talmud class would be a uh, complicated scene, <laughs> especially if he was 14, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. post-prison, though. But, um, <laughs> so, yeah, we would just sit there half the day, start the day at 8 a.m. and finish at 4.45, and half your classes would be in Hebrew and, you know, with a lot of Talmud classes. And, can... and basically, you would just do interpretations of interpretations. So, for me, early rebellion, before yeah. I found the drugs, was... Yeah. Yeah, you know, a lot of like arguing with rabbis, you know, a lot of sort and of you're defiance to, right? in that area. Yeah. But really, and uh, yeah, I really, I used to really enjoy that. Um, and also, I remember I enjoyed seeing the Passion of the Christ and being like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't need subtitles, but that's not really true. I don't speak it that well. But, um, but yeah, it was, I think it, it I think what's complicated about it is like if you consider like what is sort of uh, like why the, the self-hating Jew, you know what I mean? What is this uh, thing, this loathing that, that I just, uh, this, uh, I can't manage, you know? And I yeah. think really what it is is having, uh, like the way I grew up was such a like, like hypercritical, hyperanalytical sort of um, a mind that you're supposed to really encourage, you know, so that like what I admire in people often is an ability to just be like, just be present, you know? Yeah. And for me, like the neuroses involved in, you know, choosing like to go right or left, let alone like an actual life decision. It's just like, like the Talmud. It's like interpretations of interpretations of interpretations. And I can just keep going there and like analyze a thing to death. And I don't know if that's necessarily so useful. I mean, that's part, one of the aspects I think that I don't know if I mean, I certainly doubt that that's uh, exclusive to Jews or anything. But I'm saying that what I feel like that education did for me ultimately was uh, in in my life now, it kind of created this thing where I could just keep spinning. Um, yeah, and it, even if it's like, uh, like I think I'm somewhat grounded around uh, knowing that there's like, you know, there's kind of like there's no wrong answer. It's like an abortion. Like yeah. once you make a decision, it was the right decision. All right. right, you kept the baby, great. You have a child. You got rid of the kid. Okay, it wasn't that time for you yeah. to have a child. You right. know. Yeah. And um, so I kind of I know that, but also like I can. Really, in both sides. Like, yeah, I can yeah. really talk it through. I mean, I can talk it to death, mm-hmm. and I can do it on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, With which, yourself, plus crack, bad. You know, what I mean? <laughs> a lot more time. It's like, you know, a lot more awake time. Yeah, yeah this yeah. is like this is not enough. Sure, uh, things get mystical. Things get you know. You start reading signs into things. Yeah, things get very yeah. biblical at that moment. Yeah, yeah, they do. Hearing voices, and whatnot. I mean, it's really it's such a nightmare. It's so it's, yeah. what's even weirder to think about is like knowing the horrors of sort of uh, what you know one endures when deep in addiction. Like yeah. the idea that it even still appeals at all is confusing, and yet sometimes the mind can just get so loud, you know, and unpleasant that it's like. Uh, well, what, when did you start acting precisely? When I was six. So you're already doing that. You're at Yeshiva. You've already done your first movie. I'd already done Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah. It was like my big early yeah. scene. And you were out here already? No, I was in New York. 
Oh, really? They cast you out of New York for that? Yeah, I think it was like the first season or the first two seasons of yeah. Louis Playhouse. We were the Playhouse gang. Yeah. And uh, did a picture in Israel that I've never seen. Which one was that? Uh, I think I did two. I did yeah. one with like two big Israeli stars, Sippy Shavit and Safi Rivlin. Uh-huh. <laughs> two really, uh-huh. Uh-huh. They're like uh, the Meryl Streep and Jack Nicholson in oh, Israel, really? these two. And you played their daughter? I don't remember. You don't... <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, but you were in it. But I was in it. I mean, I remember a hot air balloon was involved. And, uh-huh. You know, there there are some upshots to acting as a kid because you're like, oh, it's Cherry, I'm sitting on you, you yeah, know, yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm in a hot air balloon. Yeah. But uh, the downsides are the damage later in your <laughs> fucking life. <laughs> That's basically the downside. But so when when you started acting, I mean, like, it just it didn't keep going. I mean, you you never stopped. I'm looking at your kind thing of right now. like every couple of years, anyways, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the sort of significant event was probably like the Woody Allen movie at 16 was really what sort of uh, propelled it into a different, more grown-up Do you sort rem- of a thing. What was working with him like? Well, I've talked to other people about it, and they say he's a, he was a, he's a little detached. Mm-hmm. What was your experience with him? I mean, my experience is, was... Which movie was it? Was Everyone Says I Love You. Oh, yeah, okay. That was the musical, right? Yeah, I was 16. Yeah. Um... Um, first of all, one of the problems was I was a real wake and bake stoner at the time, yeah. which like, I mean, later in life, I mean, I can't even imagine. When did the that. drug start? Pretty much then, pretty much around okay. 15. Okay. And so I think that, but when I first went in, I, you know, there was a lot of, when I first went in to meet him, Yeah. I think there was a lot, like, he was like, how was your day? And I was in, um, a long skirt and like long sleeves uh-huh. and I was stoned. I yeah. like just smoked some weed out the window of his bathroom over there on Park Avenue. Yeah. And, um, I just launched in, like, I didn't know the protocol of like, you know, when Woody asked you a question, you just say, uh, I'm fine. <laughs> how are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was like, let me tell you about my day. All right. Yeah. I'm in this fucking yeshiva over here on yeah. 79th Street. It's a fucking nightmare. The kids are so mean to me. It's like, I get, it's like, I, I, no, I don't have enough time for the fucking Talmud homework. I'll yeah. do it in the class. Like, what? And I think I launched into, you know, my parents and the Zionism and the Israel and blah, 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 blah. And I think that he was sort of really, uh, <laughs> Like, okay. And brought me back like three more times where I continued to do that each time, yeah. you know, and he was really like, all right, she could, I guess she could play my daughter, you know? And, um, <laughs> and then I think when I got there though, it was like, I, I think I had such a fantasy and I'm probably, I, I, I would, uh, you know, I'm not a therapist, but I would think the most obvious thing was because of my uh, lack of a relationship with my father, I was probably so eager for kind of like a father figure uh-huh. that the fact that he was just, a uh, you know, a director who knew so much what he was doing and kind yeah. of is not the warmest guy on earth. I think it was like increasingly confusing for me as the movie went on. You know what I mean? Because I really the, wanted, yeah. you know, things I've gotten. Like when I worked with um, Alan Arkin, he was very much like felt like that guy to me, you know, or even uh, like Alan Aldo was in the Woody Allen movie playing, uh, he was my stepfather in it. And he felt like very sort of, you know, w- much right. warmer to me. Yeah, but yeah. I think that, um, you know, I, I, I wanted that. And I think that was really, that was hard for me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Plus, I would do things like I would memorize everything, and then I'd come to set, and he would just sort of jumble it up. And I'm not, you know, improv guy. It's like, the, I mean, it's the thing I'm probably most blown away by. And, you know, like I just uh, did a day working with uh, Horatio Sands, right, who I yeah. know for many years and adore. And, yeah. and, uh and I, I like I was I'm just so like in awe of him. Like it's like watching an athlete or something, you know. Because right, right. I just like the ease, like the way he's not breaking a sweat, and yeah. it's just like he can't help himself, right, right, you know. Right, yeah. Um, but certainly at 16, I had a lot of education in Talmud, but I didn't have a lot of uh, improvisational experience at like the UCB or something. Sure. So I was just I was sort of lost when he would start jumping around the script, and I was doing my best to keep up, but also with things that like I didn't know about, like Tintoretto's, and I just all sorts of weird art terms, and I, it was hard for me. What is that? What's a Tintoretto? It's a fucking uh, art. Go to Venice, you see the art. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, but in other words, it was stuff that was just sort of I was. Uh, but, see, but but isn't it interesting though that, that Woody Allen probably defined somewhat of your sense of humor yeah. as a Jewish kid, as a Manhattan kid, as an intellectual. Yeah. That you know your assumption to have these conversations with him and have those expectations out of him were not outlandish because yeah. you probably grew up with the guy in your mind. Yeah, and yeah, and I, but I mean I think that when push came to shove, I I couldn't. Um, you know, I mean I wonder how different it would really be now, but I do think that. The lack of experience combined with the fact that I was so into, you know, I was doing a lot of stuff. I was like smoking cigarettes and hiding, you know, and I I was just in such a weird sort of vulnerable moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was also just really intimidating in the sense of like, 
You know, suddenly, like, number one on a call sheet of, like, Julia Roberts and fucking uh, Natalie Portman and Goldie Hawn and, like, all these people. And I was the narrator, and it was all really, you know, um, well broken up. I mean, it's not like I'm, uh, you know, it's a very, like, ensemble movie, but I just think that it was confusing for me because they were all so comfortable in the sort of stuff that I see that, frankly, sort of, like, revolted me uh, later in life when I eventually was, like, walked away. But all this kind of... They were so good at being, like, you know, charismatic movie stars all the uh-huh. time. And, uh-huh. like, in the hair and makeup trailer mm-hmm. and just giggling. And, like, you know, and I actually... I mean, I, I, I like all of them as individuals. I mean, yeah. they were... Like, Julia Roberts, you've never met a more fucking charismatic person who deserves to be a movie star in your life, other than maybe, like, uh, Tom Hanks, who has the same thing. If you're yeah. just like, dude, you deserve to be... You're mm-hmm. fucking... You're lovely. Mm-hmm. You're nice. You seem to... You remember my boyfriend's name. You know what he does. For, uh, it's... You know, and they're just so warm. And when you're working with them, so talented and so, like, you know, right there and present. So it's not like a personal attack. I, I just, I didn't, like, I didn't know where I fit in in the world of kind of like a giggling Drew Barrymore and like a charismatic, you know, radiating, uh, you know, white light sort of a Julia Roberts. I just felt very kind of, I think, lost, you know. Um, well, you sort of agree. In a way that I'm so full of shit now that I think I would be more capable of handling. Or really what I mean by that is I have enough experience, like whatever, now, like 40 movies later, you know, uh, like fucking whatever, 20 years in showbiz or something. I think I could probably handle a little bit easier kind of, you know, finding my own space in that. And well, you seem to have, but like, you seem undeniably who you are. You know, in terms of like, when I think of Tom Hanks or I think of Julia Roberts, okay, fine, they're, they're movie stars, they're actors, but you seem singular in that you come with a full bag of personality. That you, you know, like, you are a personality. I don't necessarily attribute that to them. Oh, and I think that's a little tricky. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that maybe. You're... I mean, maybe, well, I mean, you know, and, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure, you know, whatever. It's like, but I think maybe also I just, uh, I was so, probably like unformed you know right in a lot of ways sure. and just like so like wildly self self-conscious you know i just like the whole experience of being a person and <laughs> not really knowing how to navigate you know like what i've realized in my adult life is kind of it's okay to sort of uh to talk about how you feel in an honest way yeah. and that uh actually most people sort of have a similar experience at least sometimes they just won't talk I, about I, it. I thought you know what i mean i was yeah. much more sort of shame-based i think sure. about the fact that like you know i'm terrified or I want to do a good job, yeah. or uh, you know, I've never been in this situation before. I think I just wanted to like launch into fitting in, much like a teenager, and sort sure. of a lot of ways in the ways I got into trouble with drugs, which was like, you know, oh, I want to be like, oh, if you guys are fucking uh, doing all those that cocaine, yeah. I'll do a bunch too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so I think yeah. I just wanted to already be there without yeah. having any idea of how to sure. be there. When did that start? I mean, when like if you were sixteen on that on that set, just smoking weed, when did it get ugly? How many movies later? Like, I'm trying to think what year that was. I mean, I got really... Oh, okay, so that's 96. Yeah. So that's like your fifth movie, Everybody Says I Love You. And then you did Swamps of Beverly Hills, which was genius. And that's when he worked with Arkin, and he was a sweetheart. Yeah. I I love that guy. He's just the best. I mean, he's just such a... It's like everything you want him to be. Yeah? So after the Swamps of Beverly Hills, is that where it started to get bad, or what? I mean, listen, I was always a wild one, yeah. and um, but I think that it was really, you know, there's a difference between, like, m- like sort of partying yeah, and uh, being like, yeah, Janis Joplin, heart on my sleeve. Like, I show up at this meeting with a fifth in my back pocket, and let's just do it. I don't know why I sound like I'm no, in, in no. hip-hop when I say that, but I'm like, yeah, I'm Janis Joplin. Um, but, but were those always it, your heroes, though? I mean, yeah, really? and I think that, so I, I think there was, I was still sort of already already that way, but right. it hadn't, I think it was the hard drugs that really took it to another level, and the, the full-blown addiction, and... And sort of, I remember making like a very clear decision when I sort of threw in the towel on like life. Yeah. And I was having a lot of, uh, thematically, it was a lot of like, remember in Cat on Hot Tin Roof, the Big Daddy with the mendacity yeah. speech, you know? Yeah. So it was a lot of like in my head were a lot of things about like mendacity, you know? <laughs> like I just for some reason, or have you ever seen the, um, you know, that Fellini short Terrence, um, with Terrence Stamp called uh, Toby Dammit? It's, uh, I haven't seen it. It's epic. There's this um, thing based on uh, three Edgar Allan Poe stories called Spirits of the Dead, and one of them is Roger Vadim, and the other one's Louis Maul, and the third one is Fellini. And it's basically Terrence Stamp, like, right, you know, he's a like a broken, drug-addled movie star, and yeah. he's, like, driving to the awards ceremony, but everyone has, like, sort of demon faces and, like, tits everywhere, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. just, like, cackling. And, uh-huh. 
And I think I was starting to have that experience. And once that happened, um, I sort of made an active choice to kind of like walk away and be like, listen, this is the fucking truth is the belly of the beast. And, you know, I'm mean, just not about like dancing on tables. This is about hanging out with one legged Tony who has a colostomy bag and his fucking, you know, uh, uh, with a project apartment with the little tiny roaches crawling down the wall and like, that's real, you know, passing the pipe and going in the bathroom to, you know, Shoot, shoot heroin with the girls who are uh, turning tricks and luckily I have residuals you yeah. know what I mean right and I just like I, I don't know what what I, I think I was just sort of like what what is this about like this is fame who, who why is that the big end in life right. like it, it got to empty. be like you know let me borrow a dress to go to your movie premiere so you can take my picture and then like maybe you'll give me a job if I'm skinny enough fuck you like I just yeah. I didn't want to do it you yeah. know and I was sort of like there's no there there you know right. and and uh and so once that happened <laughs> is when it really got bad. Because then, like, periodically I would still try to show up to, like, you know, do a movie. Like, the biggest debacle of which was probably the poor Rob Zombie who, you know, made the mistake of uh, casting me in, um, I think it was House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah. That was his riff on the B-movie thing, right? The horror movie? It sounds yeah. like he would have fit right no, no, in. No, 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 no. That was his first one. Okay. And that's where I met him, and then we hit it off. I hit it off with his wife, uh, Sherry Moon, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, uh And uh, suddenly he, uh, we were going to, like, Metallica concerts, like, private Metallica concerts, talking on the phone about the character who was going to write me in Devil's Rejects. Right, right. And I became convinced at this time that I, so I fired everybody. And I was, because I started getting increasingly paranoid they were going to show up and do interventions. So right? this was, which, which drug was the, the forefront now? Well, this was when I'd made the decision that the best way to get rid of my heroin problem was through uh, crack. Okay. Okay, because I didn't like cocaine and <laughs> that it was just like causing me too much trouble. I yeah. could never stay awake. Right. There was like, I, one was. boyfriend broke up with me because he was like, you just always want to be in bed, like watching movies and, and sleeping, really. <laughs> I was like, so? I was like, what are you so, like, wired for? You know what I mean? It was like some, like, lanky skateboarder I picked up along the way. Yeah. It's like, that's your problem. <laughs> um, so did you start with and, uh, heroin snorting it or just shooting it? I was uh, with the snorting and the smoking and then eventually the shooting. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so that was a bad scene because yeah. then I was like, so I fired everyone. I was like, I'm going to do this new thing called punk rock acting. It's yeah. never been done. I'm going to be the Johnny Thunders of yeah. acting. Oh, right? And I yeah. was, like, on this mission. and. Yeah. Just like couldn't make it. I was just like days late, like yeah. pull, having the car pull over to the airport motels so I yeah. could get a room for an hour, missing the flight. Yeah. Finally showed up at his house with like a neck brace, being like, hey, listen, I got into a car accident. You know? <laughs> you, like, you just stopped to buy a neck brace? Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, in retrospect, that's like one of the more insane things I've ever done. Like actually like finding his house in Hancock Park and being like, listen, this wasn't on me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and Act him being God. so warm, like yeah. talking to me through the night, like yeah. stay in the guest room. Yeah. I'll write you a new part. And I still just couldn't fucking make it to set the next. Like, I just was so deep in it at that time. And, yeah. and, and I think that. That was really kind of the end. That's probably around like 2003 or four. Like that trip just evolved into a real like, oh, let me see about, you know, like picking up tricks on fucking Santa Monica Boulevard because I was looking for drugs or like I would go. Did you do that? To, yeah. And I would go to like uh, Crazy Girls when I'd get like 86 from the Chateau bathroom for like smoking out the bathroom or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Then uh, they, I would just walk across the street to crazy girls and like sit in the women's room and yeah. where all the strippers have to come in because I'm a girl yeah. and wait for them to be like, yo, American pie. And yeah. then I'd be like, let's go back to your place. And because strippers have the drugs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh-huh. And so that was really when there was kind of like this point of no return chapter that. But you were actually turning tricks. No, me? Yeah. No, I wasn't turning tricks. I was picking up tricks. Oh, okay. Do you like how offended I got? Like, <laughs> what about my story suggests that I would ever <laughs> suck dick for drug money? I mean... I, I don't know. I did. I, my mistake. Yeah. Why, why did You're you right. go into it? I, I did I say... <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm telling you, a really nice guy started okay, about my going to school at Vassar, and you totally uh, <laughs> spun it into. And um, no, I mean, I never, I never had the opportunity to turn a trick, yeah. but uh, you know, I probably wasn't very far from that, and I certainly hung out with a lot of girls who did. Yeah, you know, the and strippers, just like strippers, yeah, yeah. and you know what I mean. And when you were in this, though, where, you know, I, I mean, I've been in, uh, you know, a certain drug haze. I don't know that yeah. it went as deep as you, but. There's some party that says like you know why this is this is real real life yeah exactly and you know this is you know we are we are in it 
Yeah. And you don't realize that you've been doing something for three days with people you don't know and you haven't talked about anything and all you want is more. Yeah. Yeah. So you're sitting there with strippers. I'm sure it was fun to a certain degree, but I can't imagine at that point it was fun. I mean, it, you know, it was mostly, it was like a lot of it was, you know, it's dark and scary, like drug addiction at that level. And uh, I, it's amazing. but it was very much like, this is real. This is who I am yeah. now. And this old person was kind of like, uh, you know, this creation of my parents were putting me in acting as a kid. Yeah. And that's all full of shit. And this is the truth. And I think I was on like such this, like, you know, life's mission of like the truth, the truth, sure. honesty, Cassavetes, the truth, no, you know, yeah, yeah, and no, injustice, right. like injustice as a theme being so revolting that I couldn't manage it, you know, and right. And so you rationalize it as sensitive and reacting. Uh, you rationalize it as an artistic sort of quest. Yeah, like sort of, yeah, and 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 they just think you know part of the reason drugs are bad for you is I mean they're bad for your health and uh, they're addictive. Yeah, they're right. But yeah, addictive. but the romance of it, the romanticization yeah. of it, I can definitely relate to. Yeah, it is a whole underworld of of behavior, and but it's weird when you read about like when you read Burroughs, or you read yeah. about like if you really read about Johnny Thunders, it was horrible. Well, that's <laughs> I mean I think that's kind of the thing. Yeah, they that, all look great. The problem. Yeah, exactly. And you the continue. problem is drug addicts are skimmers. They're book skimmers. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they only read the back. <laughs> I just look at the pictures. Uh, look the, at he the, looks really cool. Looks great. Those pants are great. He's so um, thin. But yeah, yeah, and but I do think that you worked. The amazing thing is how many fucking movies you did in the midst of all this shit. Uh, yeah, I don't know how. Uh... Do you remember a, a specific moment where you thought that uh, that that it was bullshit? That were you were you at an award show where you're like, oh god, or was it just a collection of events? And yeah, I, th I think it was probably a collection of events of just, yeah, yeah. I mean, more than anything, I just being like, you know, still even, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is back to the Holocaust or whatever, but just like sort of feeling like, so really, this is the contribution? Like, I hadn't quite wrapped my head around the idea that this was like, so this is the topic is yeah. like, you know? Yeah. Trying out for a job and being in a magazine, yeah. that's going to be the rest of my life is talking about this. Like, it's important, you know? Right. We should remember, what about Golda Meir? Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Let's so, get back to that. You know, so I was sort of like... Golda Meir, the strippers and crack. Um, But, I know, I, I, I don't think there was like a defining... Right, right, right. I think, yeah, probably there were some bad breakups along the way that really contributed to being like, life has no meaning. Like, I think there was definitely sort of a perfect storm of just, uh, yeah... Yeah. Like a lot of things, and and I think also maybe not being uh, probably like not being as as challenged as I would have liked to be professionally, maybe contributed to it. That and also I wasn't you know going off to the jungle to make Apocalypse Now or something, right? You but, know? And also you were insulated in celebrity culture, which is horrifying. I would imagine that there are certain yeah. expectations. You're a public personality. You, you kind of roll with the people that are also in that business, and I have to assume that stops seeming like real life fairly quickly. Yeah, I mean. You know, I definitely think what's so what's so weird about now being kind of, uh, you know, essentially not so dissimilar from what I walked away from, though I yeah. will tell you that it was very complicated to be like, so you're telling me that all that was just to, like, come back and try out for another fucking job? Like, you know what I mean? And yeah. have to sort of, like, rebuild the, the this mess I created. That's why I did all that? Like, this is great. Like, so I'm like, now I'm, like, uh, auditioning for a pilot? Like, that's what just happened? That's what, that was, you know that's what, I mean? what you fought for, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that was, I was like, I, yes, I really won that war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, so that was pretty upsetting. Um, and, like, not getting the job? Okay. So glad I walked away from that pretty fucking decent career. Um, but uh, I don't even know. What the, oh, I'm just saying that what's wild is how much kind of uh, perception, like internal uh, perception changes things. Like, yeah. you know, that you can basically exist in a very grounded way. Maybe this is just also getting older. I think maybe I was just like never born to be an ingenue. Like, I just think maybe that wasn't my trip, like being... You think you were disappointed because of that for some reason? I don't know. I just think I was much more like into, you know, like Warren Oates as yeah. a kid. Sure. And yeah, I yeah. was, or even like the good guys for me were like Julietta Messina or Susan Terrell in Fat City. You know, it wasn't really, uh, uh so, I, so I just think that, that I, um, str those... str struggled with like not really being, that there wasn't, I wasn't doing that kind of stuff. But that tone doesn't really exist anymore. Maybe it's coming back a little now, <laughs> but I mean, certainly when you were in, in the peak of your career, even the independent films, we're not really doing that. I mean, movies weren't really doing what those movies did. Yeah. I mean, it was a different time. The 70s represented something grittier, something that seemed to be closer to what you were 
idealizing anyways. But yeah. I don't know that the jobs were really there, were they? Uh, no, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I'm sure some people were making uh, some really, you know, good ones. Um, but yeah, I think that probably uh, irked me. And, <laughs> and anyway, I'm just saying that the, yeah, it's weird how like now I can sort of do it from a much more, I don't know if it's because I'm older and maybe like because of. We've been through some shit. You've been humbled, yeah. man. You've been beaten yeah. up. And you so know, maybe you're... that's what I needed to do. I don't fucking know. Of course. You survived somehow. What, what, what made I, you stop? You got I, sick, I, I right? I think maybe, yeah, I think it was also probably just like working out childhood stuff had to happen. You know what I mean? Like really working out. I think I needed to make a decision to do this uh, on purpose. Yeah. You know, as opposed to just sort of finding myself there and not understanding why I wasn't going to college or sort of doing something uh, with my life. Well, no, I also... And now I've come to terms with that. <laughs> That's all right. But no, I, I think that I really needed to like make an act... Like I did this, the like I did theater. I did this Mike Lee play, and that really that like, must have been amazing, you know. And how was it like working with Mike Lee? Mike Lee, he was he had done the play in in London, so we yeah. did the first one in New York at the New Group. This guy Scott Elliott directed it, and that was great. I mean, Mike Lee came by and sort of worked with us a little bit, and that was amazing. But I do think that like that was sort of the first job that really got me in enough sort of. Um, it was like enough meat for me to wrap myself in, like how right. to do an accent and all this sure. stuff. And I was so scared; I'd never done a play before. So I think doing that sort of really helped me to be like, okay, this is important again. Because back when I loved acting, I mean, it was only because I had built up um, sort of like music and books and movies yeah. to such a point that it yeah. was like this un, you know, unreachable uh, like mountain of, of uh, this is what I think it's supposed to be all about. Right, you know? right, right. That I, Unreasonable expectations for yourself. Yeah, and, and like such a great love of that stuff is yeah. like the only things that make sense in life. But what made you stop? I mean, we do. You got sick, right? Um, yeah, I got. And I had warrants for my arrest. Helped. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, my body just couldn't take it anymore. Like I just, I, I feel like I found. Eventually, I was in a, like in a hospital room somewhere. Like I don't know. I did a real tour of the, you know, east, uh, <clears throat> sort of. Um, you know, below 23rd Street, um, First Avenue Hospital. So yeah. it was either in Bellevue or Cabrini or Beth Israel. Yeah. And I was like um, uh, in a bed and I was just like, my body was so weak. I was like 75 pounds, you know, and I was like still kind of had the fight in me, but there was a warrant for my arrest. And they were like, well, if you leave the state, you know, and go to treatment, you can, uh, you can evade that yeah, arrest. Yeah, you can beat it. You know? Yeah. And I was what like. What was it for? Um, criminal mischief. What does that mean? It's harassing my neighbor. Oh. <laughs> According to her, all right? Yeah. Uh, listen, I mean, I could own up to my side of the street, but the bottom line is she was fucking asking for it. No. <laughs> it's and, New York. It's New York. And Come like, uh, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah, get out of my space. Yeah. Can't you tell him I? What are you, why are you even like fucking with me right now? What are you, are you looking for a fight? You're going to get one. And yeah. um, uh, uh, anyway. So, so you went to treatment. So, I mean, and then, like, you know, I would try to leave, and it was like... You thought it, huh? Yeah. I, I mean, I wasn't really interested in... Uh, like, once it was like I was like a year clean, I was yeah. sort of like, all right, let me give this thing a shot. Right. But up until that point, I was just still... I mean, I identified so strongly with this. I mean, I think, like, the mentality that you have to be in to kind of go that, that far is, is really... It's a, it's a whole different mind and oh yeah you're possessed yeah yeah and it, but the weird thing is is that you know as much as you know even if you have moments where you romanticize it now you know what what in talking to you you're sort of like a you know a classic almost active you know energized engaged jewish intellectual what's wrong with That's that you know, like so uh, I could see you teaching a class that you'd be the, like the, the professor that smokes. Yeah. You know, like they all want to take on like, addiction yeah, yeah, 101. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, <laughs> but your interests and your your understanding of of things, uh, high minded, is very deep and very uh, impressive. Thank you, sir. How did how did you stop? How did I stop doing yeah, drugs? Yeah, what was your what happened? It was coke and booze and uh, you know everything. I, you know, I never I I snorted heroin a bit, but fortunately I like going up more than I like going down. Mm -hmm. But it just got, it just became dangerous. I mean, not unlike what you're saying, like I was not able to live in the world you were living in because I had a very active feeling that someone was going to die and it was probably going to be me. And, you know, I, I don't know, I don't want to die like that. Like, you know, when, when you do drugs, you increase your ability to be in a situation to either catch a bullet, catch a bat, you know, catch a bad dose, whatever it's going to be, it just increased to that point. And fortunately, I guess I was married at the time to a woman who wouldn't tolerate it. 
And then some other woman reached out to me, and I'd gotten sober once before. I was I left L.A. in uh, '87. I was at the comedy store and I was hearing voices. I'd coked myself into psychosis and I was in trouble. And I went to rehab. I got about a year and a half clean. I started slowly getting back up there, and it was sort of like that for many years. Like I got 14, but the first time I went to rehab was '88. So it's taken me 25 years, you know, to get 14 in a row. But uh, it really just came down to fucking locking into the goddamn program in a way. Like, you know, when I first, when this woman, I fell in love with her, so that helped. I would have followed her anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I just went to meetings all the time. I wasn't working. You know, I was a comic. So I'd go to two or three a day. And eventually just the competition factor of like, you know, once you get some time, you're like, I'm not giving this up. Like it was almost, yeah. to me, like I think a lot of what got me through it was just sort of like, I'm going to win. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna, I'm fucking gonna do it, and then like somehow it the somehow the obsession it actually did, did, went away, and I, you know, and, and it got easier after that. It was not easy to deal with myself, and you know, I burned through that marriage and shit. A lot of shit went down sober, but but I don't have the obsession to use that. I mean, that is gone. Yeah, I know it can come back, and it's scary. That's the scariest thing. I don't know if you go, but like you know, when you go to meetings and you hear the guy that's like you know had twenty years, and they go out, you're like, how the yeah, you fucking kid. like, and I found myself very moved by people's struggle, even by yours. Like when people clean up, like when I hear the story of what they went through, and like I, it's one of the like I genuinely choke up yeah. at the the reality that you know maybe people like your grandparents who put a glass of wine on the table, whoever, don't necessarily understand that it's a life or death thing. They think like, well, can't you just stop? No, I can't. Yeah, and you know I'm fighting with a monster. So when I hear the struggle that people have and they, they sort of, at least for the moment, are succeeding in beating that, that life-threatening monster, I find it very moving. It's very powerful. Yeah. What about you? I mean, well, I think that people, like, like sorry, people say whatever, like, if the quality of your life clean isn't better than the quality of your life using. I mean, it doesn't make sense that you wouldn't, you know, and I yeah. go go back out and I, I just think that. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, life is... I mean, you're talking about people who already have, like, a high sensitivity to, like, sort of, right. like, the majesty and the brutality of life. And yeah. they're already kind of experiencing life as this really, you know, like, God, it's so poetic. And, yeah. like, oh, my God, you know. Yeah. Homeless people, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. too much to kind of... And, I mean, I think a lot of it that I think about now is uh, that helps me sort of, like, I spent so many years, like, being, like, I hate myself and I want to die that, like... You know, I'm going to fucking die. I might as well uh, live a little. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just did so much of that sort of looping thinking that I'm just But you, really you felt that way before be... you used drugs? The I hate myself business? Yeah, and then I think even, like, I mean, I just think that the whole thing is really, it's, like, hard. Like, the first bunch of years are also just really brutal, you hard. know? Oh, yeah, it's still, And now I just am, like, uh, I feel very, like, I just feel really, you know, lucky that I have this sort of, like, precious uh thing that yeah. can you know do you hate, hate yourself less yeah yeah it, i mean I, for sure i, I mean especially well i mean listen i hated myself a lot no but i mean really i, I do think i hate myself but don't you think it has less. had something to do with the fact that like the one thing i related to that you were saying was that you know when you come from uh well, it's not necessarily Jewish, but the uh, a premium was put on education. Yeah, and and then you were also you know you know sort of struggling through that, like you know you you, you can never know enough. You constantly got to you know learn more, and you, you know and then you aspire to be something that wasn't working out. But there's always this idea that you're never quite meeting the mark, and I you know it, in and it comes in parental language. It's sort of like, oh, why didn't you you couldn't get an A? I guess it'd be you know there's just this mm -hmm. this idea. And I don't, I'm not going to say it's necessarily Jewish that you're never quite fucking doing good enough or you're never quite, you know, living up to your potential. To me, that it generated a lot of fucking self-hate. Like, you know, just sort of like, I'm just not fucking good enough. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, especially when you couple that with sort of like the expectations of... uh you know, it's that thing of, like, um, uh, you know, the gifted children of narcissistic right. parents, you right. know? So when you couple that with, like, sort of your parents, uh, your uh, unbalanced parents' expectations right. Right. of, you know, this, this uh, that it's got to be extraordinary or it's essentially meaningless. Right. It's, I think, a really, you know, uh, a complicated thing. I mean, it's the exact opposite of, like, go gentle and, like, you know, right, just right. be yourself. Right. It's much more like if you're not exceptional, you're essentially a waste of, of space. You yeah. Know? And I, I think that it's a very... 
you know, natural instinct to kind of self-preserve by rebelling against that. You and know? that's what saying, you grew up with? Like, fairly, yeah, yeah. Like saying, like, you know, don't fucking tell me I got to be, you know, it's like, right. in other words, oh, yeah. it's like, I'm going to try and do things that should be on, on my own terms, you yeah. know? Yeah, am I exceptional now? Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But... But yeah, just like, no, like I had uh, a mother who was basically, like I remember after Slums of Beverly Hills, she was like, you know what? Hey, first of all, you really should have gotten a boob job. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> like, you're, you know, you've got an ass and like you really want to get the, the whole thing going. And so that was like a thing. And then it was like, uh, well, do you regret it now, Natasha? Do you regret passing on Buffy now? And it was like Buffy the Vampire Slayer that I sort of passed on right after Slums of Beverly Hills. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to really do these kind of, I'm not going to really do a vampire uh, thing. The TV series? Yeah, the TV, the TV yeah. series. And I was like, hey, you, know, you know, it's not for me. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, I want to make pictures, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> and she would still bring it up, like, fucking never, passed on Buffy. Never, they're always disappointed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And I always do it, I mean, it's just... It's horrible. It's just it's weird. Hard. Yeah. But you know, it's like, I don't know. Listen, How at the end you... of the day, I'm so, it's, it's wild that I, you know, turned out okay. So it's like now it's very hard to sort of be angry at any of it in a way because. Well, good for you. Who, the, who I mean, I, it's, it's, uh, so, so, uh, you know, miraculous to be, uh, you know, participating. Well, that's good. I'm glad that you have that, that, that disposition because, like, you know, to grow up with, be, <laughs> with, uh, with basically parents who are, you know, dismissive, really, and, and not accepting of their own child is fucking horrendous. How are you supposed to be trained to be an emotionally, uh, even a little bit stable adult? With that, how how the fuck can you do it? Yeah, do you know what I mean? That like you, your role models, the people that were supposed to love you, it was so fucking conditional to the yeah. point where you know after you do a great movie that they're still sort of like, wow, well, your boobs aren't good enough. I mean, yeah. what the fuck? I mean, yeah. how are you supposed? to... You're not equipped it's at all. The same thing my boyfriend says to me now. <laughs> oh no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it really is. It becomes this sort of thing, and maybe that I don't know. Talking to you now, I mean. In this sort of very Oprah way, I, maybe that was uh, a part of it was basically like the conditional love and then sort of finding myself in an industry that was also so conditional. Right. You know, it was maybe sure. just too many fucking conditions. It yeah. was like, I don't want to exist in this uh, yeah. playing field. And then I guess essentially, unless you have a really strong sense of grounding, I mean, all, you know, ultimately, if you're. Like, I, I always think, uh, like, somebody who doesn't get into trouble, like a Jessica Biel or something, you know what I mean? Yeah, must yeah. have really good parenting, you know? And I worked yeah, with her, yeah. and her mother was there, and, yeah. like, I mean, she was, like, 25, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it was nice, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and she really thought she was, like, the fuck is undressed Thompson? She doesn't know undressed Thompson. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, but, you know, I thought, oh, that must be why these people don't really fuck up, is because they have this real like a family life to kind of ground them it's a hard it's and a, that's a rough i think when you have you know i think when you have like basically a school that you know, you know they expelled me for selling weed brought me back when i was on letterman because they were like this is good alumni yeah you know right. and i was like so fuck these people sure right and like there goes also my whole sort of like re resentment against organized religion right. now that's kicked up right yeah. so now you've also taken sort of this idea of you know like, ah, yeah, I'm being looked out after, you know, by like some monotheistic God idea that I yeah. grew up with. Right. And, um, and then, yeah, the fucking parents and then this business. Or whatever. Yeah. It's funny though. Like what you said though is true. It's a very hard realization to make, especially when you romanticize outsiders, which yeah. I did as well, that, you know, it took me years to realize that, look, if you had even one good parent, yeah, your, your odds of functioning well yeah. in life are significantly better than somebody who just had selfish parents, not, not even fucking, yeah. you know, physically abusive, just yeah. emotionally dismissive or without boundaries or, or self-involved. I mean, you're fucking crippled from that. Yeah. And, and, and it's really true that like the, the realization like that, it's not so much like you guys don't understand real life. It's like, oh, they probably were properly parented and you yeah. know, there, there was love in the house. And <laughs> I mean, what a bummer that like it's, but that goes on for the rest of your fucking life. I know, it's like, when I does know. that go away? I mean, it's really, I, I mean, I do think there's a lot to be said for the whole, uh, you know, whatever. You, you get all these tools and the reparenting. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, um, right. soothing self-talk. But I remember, like, 
you know, my first few years of sort of being like clean and functioning, yeah. I was just so angry. Oh, like, yeah. oh, what fuck. do you mean? Like, it's like, what the fuck do you mean I have to make my own bed? Yeah, like, yeah, right. like nobody, like, in other words, because these basic things that I just like, didn't, nobody sort of uh, taught me. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, what do you mean you got to get there on time? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, when you make it, when you travel, you yeah. overpack. Yeah. That's how you know that you're going somewhere because <laughs> you've taken everything you own. You're now at the airport and like you're missing the flight because of how much luggage you have. Like, that's how to travel. So, like there's all like oh now you're with like fucking cool guy who's like carry on what yeah. do I need just a pair of yeah. jeans and you know yeah yeah and you're like well fuck yeah, yeah. It, it's very angry it's it's yeah because it's like you got to constantly be sort of monitoring like how to all right you're doing a good job like yeah, yeah listen but kid you're yeah. doing all right yeah, all right, listen yeah. you brushed your teeth at night yeah. too this is a fucking yeah. epic day tomorrow you know? maybe you floss <laughs> maybe you floss I mean we're gonna, yeah like when the dentist is like with the floss I'm like what, what are you insane I'm brushing my teeth I'm like eventually you just fucking change them <laughs> like you know I mean I'm surprised I still have all my teeth yeah. as it is so why yeah, it's right. like but I think I'm, that's... I'm living on borrowed time <laughs> dentist <laughs> yeah. you know you but fix I, them right but I think that, but that's also part of it too is that when you don't when you have these parents that were this way and you have this rebellious attitude Attitude. There's something you're almost like going through life defying people to parent you, yeah. like you know, like the show business, whatever it is. It's like here I am, you know, take care of it. You yeah. know that, that whole. Thing, it's, oh God, well, you seem like you're doing good. I know, I'm all right. Yeah. What's going on? Do you, you got a thing going? Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm on a new show. Yeah. That's coming out. The uh, Jenji Cohen who did uh, Weeds. Yeah. She has a new show on Netflix called Orange Is the New Black: Women's Prison. Great. Oh, okay. so that's that's happening. Is that challenging um, you? Are you excited about the role and stuff? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about that show. I actually think it's really, it's good. Great. Yeah, you know, I feel like they're really smart people, and I feel like. Uh, Are you a joy to work with now? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, hey, it's a humble guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. No, I mean, I think it. I I, I think it is. Uh, I'm guaranteed it's a lot easier than it once was. What and about I your... think I think probably it is. I mean, I think also like you know, I think as well as is uh, looping, for example, is really where I can see progress of you know that I used to be like so like, but it's not gonna match the performance, <laughs> and I would just like sit in there and like want to get into a ball and get into the state that she was in when yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. you know, this was a scene <laughs> about like my fucking world breaking down. I can't say it after three fucking beeps, you yeah. know. And now I'm a lot more like, all right, let me say the word. Yeah. That's why you guys have sound machines. Right, right. It works, it works fine. Do you remember that um, Albert Brooks in Modern Love? Like, yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. such yeah. a looping scene. That's all I can think of. I saw it again recently. Like, modern, modern Romance. That's like, yeah, and that's all I can think about now is whenever I go to a looping session, it's like, I don't want to piss these poor guys off, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean. You, have you ever worked with him? You guys would be great together. Nah, there was a movie I remember in the 90s that I really wanted. That like Christine Lottie was directing, I've since played poker with, um, and uh, I didn't get the job. But when at your approach to work now, though, are you are you know are you humble? Are you like fucking focused? You know you 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 know who you are in terms of like when you're being a diva and when you're not and that kind of shit. Yeah, and I think I just you know, um, yeah. Good. I mean, I just think it's a lot. It's it's uh, I I think I have a real sense of um, essentially like. You know, I'm just another bozo on the bus, like, you know, and hopefully uh -huh. it'll be a real, I just like show up to try to do my best. And, uh, it's like, I mean, something it's like, yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's a, you know, maybe not to take the road I took, but, <laughs> 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 but <laughs> to um, make an understatement, yeah. but like certainly to like take a few years to get some like sort of life experience <laughs> is not a bad idea <laughs> as far as, you know, the chosen profession of essentially you're supposed to be like telling people stories and how are you going to know when your entire frame of reference is like, you know, like, oh, I borrowed a dress from Chanel, you know, it's going to be really, <laughs> yeah, I just got out like, of acting school. Uh, yeah, if your life is yeah. so mm, microcosmic, all you want to do is win at life you're fucked i mean it's really you've got to have a little bit of uh so i think that like i've um i can like i have a little bit of trust that i uh you've you done know. enough you've lived enough life you've, yeah. ta you've taken it to the limit <laughs> yeah well it just means i think it, it really it, it helps because like when i read things you know like my reading comprehension uh -huh. is is uh is is better as a result because i can really know from uh, a lot of 
What must have highs you? and lows of uh, the human experience and the human condition, you know, which is yeah. essentially my job, right? Right. So, like, that's so you, why I did it. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you always knew. Yeah, just was on you, De Niro. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you had a plan. But, you know, it's, uh, and now I am. I'm very, like. Did you play a prisoner? All right, it's not so it's so high stakes. All right, action. Here yeah. we go. Yeah. You know, but yeah. still, it's very nerve wracking. Theater is terrifying. Because it's um, immediate, right? Yeah. I mean, no so take it's, two. You know, you still like that's what's, I think, weird also is uh, that sort of response to adrenaline. Like, in theory, I should be able to have like a mind that I can calm myself down by being like, like people uh, always say to me, like, after what you went through, yeah, 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 like, yeah, come yeah, on, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, do yeah, this. Right. It's opening night. No, no this is what deal. I was avoiding. Yeah. And it's <laughs> kind of like, yeah. what makes you think that I'm <laughs> any less uh, human <laughs> and like, you know, terrified <laughs> than. Um, but so that's it. And yes, I play a prisoner. Okay. Mm-hmm. Theater's exciting, though, huh? Yeah, it's just wild. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so crazy. I mean, just like, I, I was doing this play on with, uh, I was playing Ethan Hawke's sister. Yeah. And our last performance, I mean, we'd gone through like three months of this. Yeah. On the last performance, we're sitting on the sofa together. He's like rubbing his pregnant sister's feet. And I just, I remember going out that night and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to think. I'm just going to exist in the role, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, and I was out there, I was acting, and I was like, ah, oh, he's talking, I'm responding. He's got, this is acting. <laughs> and then I was just like, suddenly he was looking at me, yeah. and I was like, why is this guy looking at me? And I was like, ah, oh, Ethan Hawke is handsome. Yeah. You know, what a handsome guy. Look at him rubbing my feet. This is great, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, God, we did a good job in this play. And, you still look and at I was you. like, <laughs> I have no idea what the fuck comes next. I mean, like, but a blank like I cannot tell you like and he would just started looking at me then I realized then you become a mind reader you yeah. know so then I'm like wow and I'm like no Ethan I that that's right I I did just forget our fucking scene on the closing night I mean yeah. there's very low stakes in yeah. theory because it's not like critics or whatever yeah, right, but right. he was just looking at me like really you waited until the last fucking night so every performance you've known all your lines <laughs> and this one and it felt like just the way time can bend, you know, yeah, yeah, and like yeah. the air can change and you're suddenly like, <laughs> what? Yeah, I mean, it felt like, and I somehow we uh, did it, I guess. We did he remember. reprime you or what did he do? I don't even remember what happened. I mean, because it was probably if it had been during the run, I would have gotten some sort of speech because it was closing night. It was more like, that was amazing. <laughs> like, that was insane, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. So I don't really even know exactly what happened. And I was just sort of like, oh, cool. <laughs> but it happens. <laughs> Too late right? to play. It yeah. happens. I mean, I guess it happens. Yeah. And I, so I have a, a real admiration. It's really, it's... Uh, very athletic sport, the theater. Yeah. I mean, you really got to know your fucking paces. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, look, you look great. Thank you. And you sound great. And I'm Thank glad you're you. doing better. And it was, a, it was a thrill to talk to you. Likewise. You feel good about it? Feel good. All right. That's it. That's our show. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for, um, you know, putting up with me. Uh, that was a great talk with Natasha. Go to WTFPod.com for all your WTF Pod needs. And um, bear with me, people. I'm just a person. Uh, Deaf Black Cat lives. And, of course, Boomer lives. Boomer lives.